Hi. This is Novel Admire. Welcome to my channel. Have fun. Hero of Darkness. Chapter 1 A Man at the Edge. Winds howled along with the passing cold breeze. At the time of midnight, in the glitter of lights from skyscrapers and malls along with multiple vibrant neon signs, the city life kept running as usual. Amongst these sky-touching buildings and millions of people going about their lives, stood a man at the edge of the highest roof in one of such office buildings. He heaved a sigh, looked towards the bright moon and closed his eyes. Thinking and contemplating how and why his life came to be this way. Thinking to himself, El recast. Man, why am I the only one living so miserably? Will anything for once, go the right way for me? Why am I the only one always getting short end of the stick? It's as if the world itself is trying to tell me that I really don't matter at all. Reminiscing about his childhood, Elric remembered the young him when he was 12 years old. He was a good kid with a great talent for reading among other kids in his class. The teachers would always praise him for being quick to answers. He was always good at getting the pronunciation of words correct and could read a chapter from the book without running out of breath easily. But this made his fellow students dislike him at the same time. Some started bullying him as the days went on and even when Elric asked for help from his teachers, no one helped him. Some saying it's just a small quarrel between children while some intentionally trying to smother the incidents to avoid being accused of neglecting the students of their class by school management. So, Elric never got the help he deserved. When he told his father about how the kids at his school were bullying him, and even beating him on some occasions, instead of consoling his youngest son, his father reprimanded him to not bring such small matters into the house. His father worked in a manufacturing company for household appliances and had to spend many hours per day in the office as he was the manager of the department. So naturally, he was always tired and tensed up when he returned home. After holding his sobs somehow, Elric told his mother, Sophia about the incidents. She told him that she would talk to his teachers. Elric believed her and decided to wait for tomorrow. But the next day, nothing happened. He still got beat up again, his parents had no time to listen to him. Even his older brother, David whom Elric looked up to told him to man the hell up. David was 17 years old and part of his school's baseball team. And due to his growth spurt kicking in, he often tended to be physical with his body and rash with his mind. He paid no attention to his younger brother as if it didn't concern him. Elric couldn't ask his elder sister Jessica as she would get mad at him even if he mistakenly entered her room. She was very peculiar with her things, clothes and looks. And always spent a lot of time in front of the mirror for God knows what reasons. Author, let's call her someone with princess syndrome. So after both his family and school staff failed to help him, Elric had no choice but to endure the harassment at school. Hoping that his bullies would get bored and not target him any longer. He even stopped being active with his studies and interacting with other students and teachers like to not stand out. And later when he went to high school, he adapted the same approach. But during these times, Elric did find something to keep himself busy with. He no longer held love for historical figures or whatever they taught in schools rather in comics that he often read at the comic store a couple of streets away from his house. Somehow, these heroes from comics gave him a huge sense of belonging and an urge to be a better person. His favorites were Spider-Man and Batman. He would often imagine if getting bit by a radioactive spider will give him powers like Peter Parker or whether he could find a mysterious clan of ninjas and martial artists who could teach him how to fight like Batman. But as all things come to end, so did his interests in comics. As Elric hit puberty, he became engrossed with the culture of anime which was reaching a new horizon of popularity throughout the world. He would spend most time of his day watching them then studying for his class test tomorrow. Years later, he entered the world of novels and mangas. And like there are no exceptions. He got entangled in the web of addictive cultivation stories, Korean hunter manhwas, RPG and virtual reality game stories and the ones where a good-for-nothing otaku gets hit by truck gun and gets reincarnated or transmigrated into another world. But without realizing that he had spent these years distancing himself from his family and friends, 
he had become a loner who barely functioned in society. Spending so much time alone made him mentally become someone who liked being in solitude. Due to his innate talent for learning and remembering what he read instantly, his grade never fell below what was expected from him. Elric had realized to this point that he had the rare case of having what we call eidetic or photographic memory. He had the potential to become much more in terms of academic skills but he simply had no interest in them at this point. His parents didn't care much for him anyway. Only providing food and shelter out of obligation. He disliked both his elder brother and sister who always had the halo of entitlement around them. He didn't have anyone he could call a friend at this point. As compared to his brother and sister, Elric was someone without great ambitions and only good enough to live a mediocre life. In the upcoming years, Elric finally landed a job as an accountant in a big-name company and got a good income salary job. He finally left his house and started living alone. Even when he had any conversations with his family over the phone, it'd be him who initiated the call most of the time. Four years later. Elric was 30 years old today. He stood in a line inside a coffee shop, to get his morning dose of cocaine. Erm, I mean caffeine. Today was his birthday, yet not a single person had wished him happy birthday. No one from his family called, he had no friends even in the workplace he was heading off to. There wasn't anyone who he interacted much with if not out of necessity, and barely anyone he could even express his thoughts to. Not even a friend online or a group of fellow nerds or oticus. He had outgrown all of them. His current state of life was completely stagnant and uneventful in the last couple of years. This hit Elric really hard. For the first time in his life, Elric had found himself completely alone. Both in body and spirit. This was something he yearned for during his teenage days. But now it suddenly felt terrifying and as if he really had nobody in his life. He didn't have a pet because they needed a lot of care and Elric was indeed a man-child when it came to the responsibility of taking care of someone else. At the same time in the coffee shop, his turn came and he reached his hand out to grab the coffee cup. But he suddenly felt a warm touch in his palm. Erm, excuse me. The coffee is in my other hand. A girl with bright blue eyes, blonde hair and a very slim built body looked at Elric and signaled him to remove his hand. Ah, my bad. I was lost in thoughts. Elric said. Hurry up now. Other people are standing in the line. Elric came back to reality for real at this moment and quickly got to the side. He soon left for the office. He did notice the name on the girl's uniform before leaving. Catherine. After returning from the office and having dinner, which wasn't just a cup of noodles like standard Japanese mangas. Our boy knows how to cook. Elric recalled the event of touching Catherine's hand. For some reason, he just couldn't help but think about that moment again and again, over and over. Elric being the virgin guy who never had a girlfriend, female friends or any form of physical connection to women throughout his life, got looped into that moment given how big of a simp he had become over this point for fictional women. The ideal romantic partner for people like him only existed in novelty. After overthinking it for a long time, he finally fell asleep and woke up the next morning to follow the same cycle of corporate slave life. His routine followed for the next couple of weeks, in the meantime he'd casually greet Catherine with good morning and lolos. He had made himself familiar with her. And Catherine would greet back and sometimes even give him a soft smile, which always brightened up his day. Little did he realize that Catherine was doing it because it was part of her job to be nice to customers. But being the idiot he was, he felt like it only him getting the special treatment. A few days later, Elric stood in the same queue for his morning coffee. But this time, something was different in him. He wanted to make a move on a girl for the first time in his life. Elric thought to himself what's the worst can happen? She completely turns me down? Or at most. I end up embarrassing myself in front of few people here. Ayo, hey, why is this so hard? Elric was a total noob in this department. He had already prepared for the worst. After Catherine got free from her shift, which ended only after 10 minutes since Elric got his coffee, he came towards Catherine and asked her. Hey, Catherine. Do you have a moment? Yes. What is it? 
Oh, nothing. I just wanted to ask if you were free tonight. Catherine looked at Elric with surprised eyes. And I assume you had some plans which depended on me being free tonight? Elric was startled, have I been seen through? He gathered his courage and said yes. I wanted to ask you out for dinner. Elric said with all his might. He sounded very calm and confident as if this was a normal day-to-day -day thing for him, but inside he was like, fuck, fuck, fuck. I'm so screwed. But surprisingly in the next moment, Catherine responded. 8 p.m., pick me up at Central City Park. I live nearby. Give me your phone number, I'll send you the address later. Gobsmacked. Flabbergasted. These words could completely describe Elric's facial expressions perfectly. He didn't believe what he was hearing at all. He expected an instant refusal but surprisingly he wasn't? Um. You're not joking, right? I didn't think you'd say yes. Catherine looked at him cheekily and spoke, I was actually waiting for you to ask me out. If you had taken even longer, I would have done it myself. Was this a dream? Nobody is playing a prank, right? Wait a minute. You were? Elric asked. Of course. Out of all these people, many who are regular customers here, only you look at me with puppy eyes whenever we meet each other in the morning. Don't think I didn't notice the smile you always have after you greet me. We girls have our own intuition too you know. It was obvious that you like me. So I thought why not give you a chance? Catherine said while throwing a smirk at him. Outmatched. Elric was completely outmatched. Why was the girl saying guys lines and seemed to be in control of the situation? It was supposed to be his role. For the first time in his life, Elric questioned himself if he was truly a man. Okay. That's all he could come up with in response. And as soon as Catherine put her number in his phone, Elric quickly ran off from the scene like the flash. Author Run Barry, run. Elric did not believe what happened a few minutes ago was real. He pinched himself a few times and even slapped his face twice to make sure he wasn't dreaming. He finally mentally prepared himself for the first date in his life. He knew that he couldn't afford to go halfway tonight. Because the first impression is the last impression when it comes to dates. Surprisingly, the date went well. Elric didn't hold back. He booked a reservation in a nice restaurant, took Catherine to a zoo before dinner, had fun with her while sharing their life stories so far. To his surprise, Catherine came from a poor family. She got the job in a coffee shop to support her expenses and was also taking some acting classes. Currently, she lived in a shared apartment with a few of her college friends. Catherine was three years younger than Elric who lived alone and supported himself. So this earned his respect for Catherine. As to some men, self-dependent and hard-working women are much more reliable and have a strong character than daddy's little princesses on social media these days. After this date, things kept progressing between Elric and Catherine over the next few weeks. But one day, Catherine suddenly disappeared. She didn't pick up Elric's calls and even her roommates didn't know where she went. Elric? who was infatuated with Catherine at this point felt like something was missing inside of him. For the first time in the past two decades, he felt loss and helplessness. Do I really care about her that much? Why do I feel so empty suddenly? Elric thought. But he couldn't put his finger on what was irking him so much. Obviously. He had fallen in love. Chapter 2. The End. Three days later. He finally received a call from Catherine at night. Hey, it's me. Where are you? What happened? Why didn't you pick up any of my calls? Elric asked. I'm sorry. It's been hectic recently. I just didn't have time to explain. Catherine replied. Now tell me exactly what happened? I at least deserve to know that, right? Elric said. Well. It's my dad. He. He. Catherine suddenly started sobbing and her words stopped coming out of her mouth. You can't tell me, I'm always here for you. Elric said out of genuine worry. My dad has been diagnosed with stage 3 cancer. We just found out. He didn't tell me and my mom because he didn't want to worry us. And we don't have enough money for the treatment either. That's why he hid his illness. 
Catherine said and started crying loudly this time. I don't know what to do Elric. My dad is dying and I really can't do anything to help him. I have no money, no insurance. Nothing. Catherine's sobs didn't stop. Elric was listening to this on the other side of his phone felt as if his father was dying at this moment. Due to his attachment towards Catherine, he felt her pain as his own. He quickly replied. How much do you need? Elric asked, what do you mean? Catherine replied, I meant how much money do you need for your father's treatment? I can arrange for it. I'm an accountant, remember? He said with worry and care in his voice. Around $30,000. Don't worry. I have some savings. I can help. Elric said with a resolute voice. No, I really can't ask you to help me. We haven't known each other for that long. Even our relatives won't give us that much money even if we begged them. And I have no way to pay you back even in the next couple of years. Catherine said hurriedly. It's okay. The truth is I really like you, Kate. I know this is coming out of the blue and at the wrong time but hear me. It's okay. I trust you enough to know that you won't cheat me. And I won't be able to sleep knowing what you're going through and I could have helped. So please don't refuse. Elric said in a soft and gentle voice. After a few moments of silence, Catherine spoke again. Elric. Thank you. I mean truly thank you. I had no way to get out of this. I knew you felt about me this way. The truth is that I really like you as well. But I never thought we'd be confessing our feelings this way. Yeah, we'll have that talk again when you're in a better position. Now send me your bank account. I'll send the money. Elric said. He wasn't a dumb guy when it came to money. Aside from his groceries, rent and other taxes, he never actually had to spend much on anything. So in the past two years, he certainly made up some dough and did some side hustles for some private customers as well. If it was someone else, he'd go deep in first to see where his money was going. But for Catherine, blinded by his feelings and given the fact that she was the only person he actually felt a connection to in such a long time, he didn't think much of it and wanted to help her in her worst scenario. And appearing out as a hero who helped her family would also leave a deep impression on her parents if there came a day to meet them. Catherine sent him an account number registered in her name and Elric transferred the money without a second thought. Over the next week, he didn't get any calls from Catherine. He thought it'd be bad to disturb her in such time. On the ninth day, he finally decided to call her again to check up on her and her dad's condition. The number you have dialed does not exist. Suddenly, the network voice call lady responded after he tried to call. Elric got curious and tried again. But still nothing. He found it odd and tried from his other number which he barely used. So nobody knew his other number. But the same response came. He didn't know exactly which hospital Catherine was at so he could only go to her apartment he once visited. But after talking with the landlord and her roommates, he found out that Catherine came to her apartment the very next day after he sent her the money. Paid her three month overdue rent, packed all of her stuff and left for good. Elric didn't believe what was happening around him. He chose not to believe it. He had been duped. He asked for an address to the landlord and later he searched that address on maps only to find it non-existent. Her other information was obscure as well. Also, he found that her roommates weren't her friends from college, rather they met through an app used to search for renting apartments. There was really no other way to look for Catherine any longer. He quickly took a cab and went to the coffee shop he always went in. The owner was already familiar with Elric so he offered all the information they had on Catherine but to no avail, this was bogus information as well. Where the hell did she go? Elric shouted. He found it unbelievable that he was conned. It was one thing if she ran off out of fear of not being able to pay him back. But everything he came to know about her seemed to be a lie. Probably, Catherine wasn't even her real name. Nor did she have a dad with cancer. She seemed more of a professional than someone who did such a thing for the first time. He was nothing but a mark for her. After spending an entire day trying to find a clue for Catherine, Elric was exhausted and finally came back to his apartment. He was drained both physically and mentally. 
He was hungry but didn't have the willpower to eat something. He was still in shock. For the first time in a long time, he actually felt connected to someone. He'd go as far as to say he had fallen for her. And yet, in the blink of an eye, everything before him crumbled to dust. Everything was a lie to begin with. Finally, he fell asleep due to exhaustion. The next day, Elric didn't leave the house. He was still not over what happened yesterday. All his hard-earned money from the past two years was gone. And don't even talk about the emotional trauma that incident left on him. He called in sick leave for the next few days and contacted the police and filed a case. But there was barely anything he could offer up for investigation. He didn't even have a single photo of Catherine. All he could do was to hope for the cops to somehow find her. The next week when Elric returned to his job, everyone was sneaking glances at him. One of his colleagues came to him and said in a low voice. Didn't take you for such a fool Johnson. If you wanted to fuck a woman that badly, could have just hired a hooker. Ha ha ha. With a smug smile on the face, his colleague made the last part very loud for others around them to clearly hear it. What do you mean? Elric asked, astonished. He found that one of his colleagues was present at the coffee shop when Elric asked the owner about Catherine and later news spread about how she was a con. Which surprised many people including the coffee shop staff. But to have Cherry on the top, her scamming Elric for 30k dollars also got leaked. It didn't take much time for the news to reach his office. And literally, everyone in his department knew about his unlucky story. This put a lot of shame and mockery on his head. This was their chance to bury Elric with an excuse. Because Elric had always been a guy who got the job done at right time and never actually refused a major task. He did win the hearts of upper management based on his track record alone and they found him as a promising person to promote in the future. In a dog-eating dog world, even a simple rumor is enough to drag down your name in the mud. And the truth doesn't even matter when that happens. Elric never entangled himself in these office shenanigans but he too had his pride. He barely made it till the working hours ended. Every breath he took felt like an eternity. After the shift ended, he didn't immediately leave, he went to the uppermost rooftop of their building which was around 32 floors tall, to get a fresh breath and cool his mind. The past week gave him the worst experience of his entire life. This hurt more than the beatings he got from the kids who bullied him in school. This hurt more than the look of disappointment his parents gave him. Never was his mental fortitude and his pride was tested up to this extent. Tears dripped down across his cheeks like a river. He had finally broken down. He could no longer tolerate how messed up, lonely and pitiful his life had become. He knew very well that his own actions played a very big part in it as well. He wasn't a hypocrite to blame it all on the world and play as a victim. But at this moment, he was simply clueless. He was lost, helpless alone, desperate, yearning for someone to put a hand on his shoulder and tell him that it was gonna be okay. But there really wasn't anyone who'd come for him at this moment. Who'd he call? His parents he hadn't talked with in the past three months? His siblings who never actually had any form of bond with him since childhood? His fictional characters and idols he looked up to in his teenage days? Friends. What are those mythical creatures? A man no matter where he fits inside a society, from someone working as a janitor to a multinational company's CEO had their own self-respect and pride. But today, all of it was shattered for Elric. And he asked himself. Man, why am I the only one living so miserably? Will anything for once, go the right way for me? Why am I the only one always getting the short end of the stick? It's as if the world itself is trying to tell me that I really don't matter at all. At this very moment, he walked towards the edge of the rooftop. And looked down. Author, now we're at the exact moment where the first chapter started. Is my life worth living at all? Elric asked himself. The years of unhappiness, escapism, loneliness had brought Elric to this very moment. Catherine teaching him that one life lesson and breaking his heart was just a hole that let out the volcano that was under the ground from all these years. Her act was just an outlet. His state of mind would have shown up sooner or later anyway. 
Elric wasn't an emotional moron who did things based on a fit of rage. He was a very rational person since his childhood. But his desperation took at the best of him. He had two choices now. Go back to his apartment, cry it out. Then continue his mundane life where no one would be bothered whether he lived or died. Where he is replaceable like a pen. Or do what he thought of doing just now. Because even if he went back, what was he gonna do? Find Catherine and get his revenge on her like some movie or novel story? He very well knew that it was no longer possible for him to find her. She probably did this to many others like him. He was a fool not to see through her act. And don't mention the work environment. From now on, no matter what he did or how well he performed at work, he'll always be used as a laughing stock. Even if he quit and went somewhere else to work, his lifestyle would be the same, just a different place. Elric wiped off the final drop of tear from his cheek. He found no way to move past his current mental state. He stood on the ledge and looked up towards the midnight moon. Only now did he realize that he had been crying and lamenting for nearly seven hours now. He didn't even notice the flow of time. Elric Johnson took a deep breath and closed his eyes. He could feel the cold breeze trickling on his face and he said, Man, what a pathetic life it was. At this moment, he let go of his body and jumped down. As his body descended from the tall building, the pressure of air at such height pushed his body like a kite. His body changed angles few times until it finally landed on the ground. Thwack! Blood, guts, bones and eyeballs splattered on the side of the street. A completely gory scene that even horror movies can't imitate came to be. Dozens of people who were walking across the same lane of the street were shuddering in fear and shock. Some women among the crowd started vomiting the moment they saw what was next to them. An old man among the crowd started calling 911. Quickly the cops patrolling across the street saw the commotion and started running towards the scene. Over that puddle of meat and blood, lie Delric Johnson who chose to give up on his life than suffer any longer. To him, it seemed like the only way out. A man forsaken by the world and his can died a tragic death. Never to wake up again. Chapter 3. God of Darkness. In the void of nothingness, where the flow of time itself didn't exist and not even a ray of light could be seen. This place was neither heaven nor hell. It was just an infinite space filled with absolutely nothing as if the concept of life and death did not exist here. Suddenly, a crack in space appeared out of nowhere, it kept elongating at an extremely fast speed and in an instant, it stretched around 10 kilometers and a gigantic figure sitting on a black stone throne which was no less than the size of a mountain itself emerged from the other side of the void. This figure was akin to the height of a couple of mountains, completely clad in majestic black clothes and had a hood on the head, appearance-wise it resembled a lot to the western look of death god or dealer of souls, like a grim reaper. Its face could not be seen as if it didn't exist. It looked around for a moment and waved its right hand and created a space of its own, widening for a dozen kilometers and stabilizing itself like forming a gigantic barrier. An ancient voice, so deep that it could reach thousands of miles and decimate cities in into dust filled that entire space. Who should I pick this time? The being asked itself. Just few moments later, a set of footsteps could be heard from the void crack behind the throne and another being which was completely clad in a red and black ancient armor stepped in. There were two giant black swords that were big enough to cleave five stories building and two were hanging on its back. The warrior looking being's head was covered by a spiky and horned helmet. So whether it was a living being, an undead or a specter could not be guessed. The other being was half the size of the former who was sitting on the throne. It came in the front and kneeled in front of the gigantic being on its left knee like how a knight would in front of their king. It spoke in a hoarse yet very authoritative tone. My liege, it's about time. But I hope you reconsider your decision. We cannot make a mistake this time. Cravel, I know it worries you. We can't afford to have someone like the previously summoned humans like we did so many centuries ago. But do not worry. I have already decided upon a suitable kind of person for this task. But my liege, the one you've decided upon do not possess any qualities we need to complete this mission. 
the ones that were brought from other worlds so far had an incredible talent for leadership, had unyielding willpower and wisdom to overcome any adversity that was thrown at them. And yet all of them failed. So what could the type of person you've decided upon even do? They'll die even before reaching halfway of their objective. Cravel graveled in front of its master, yet the being did not seem to be concerned. I understand your worries but this is the exact reason I'm looking for someone who does not have anything in common with their predecessors. The being spoke and rested its head on its right hand. The palm of the being looked like something that was covered in black metal and it had no flesh or any bones. The being spoke again, this time we need someone different and very unconventional. But my liege, this is probably our last chance. You will no longer have the strength to summon anyone again, not for at least the next 1000 years. And by then, the other gods will have their own chosen ones complete the mission. It'll be a loss we can't afford at all. Cravel said with a grim face. My decision is final, Gravel. Sometimes, uncertainty can bring you wonders. This summon will be able to surpass those who came before him. The being said and didn't stand on ceremony any longer. God of Darkness waved his hand and a rift of the size of a kilometer opened inside the barrier they were in. And suddenly, millions of bright spherical white orbs with a blue hue around them rushed out from that rift. The ancient being simply glanced at all these orbs of light and its eyes shone. And a reddish wave of light swam across all the orbs and the being closed its eyes. After a few moments, it opened its eyes and waved its left hand again. Now let's see the most miserable ones with enough knowledge and experience to do our bidding. The being spoke again. In the next instant, only around 5,000 of these bright orbs were left. The eyes of this being flickered again as if it was trying to read and understand what was inside of these orbs. When it opened its eyes again, only around a hundred orbs were left. My my! So pitiable! Not a single one of these people ever accomplished anything in their lives. Well, good for me. Now let's see if I can find the most suitable person. The ancient being pulled these remaining orbs in its palm and kept staring at them as if it was analyzing something. A dozen seconds later, the being seemed surprised and exclaimed in joy. I found him. I found the perfect match. Cravel who was still kneeling sighed and shook his head. It's the end for us. He spoke to himself. The ancient being looked at the tiny orb which looked like a tiny molecule compared to its size. He waved his hand again, the rest of the white orbs that came through the rift started returning at an unimaginable speed and in just 10 seconds, only this one orb was left. I hope you don't regret this, my liege. Cravel said and looked at his master. Ha ha. You have no idea, Gravel. We've struck gold. The being said and suddenly an archaic pentagram appeared below the white orb. And the white orb shone brighter and started expanding until it was of the size of a man. And it started shrinking in a vertical direction, four limbs started forming from it. Two hands, two legs, a head and a, hash censored hash, came to be. There was a human looking face but the outlines hadn't formed completely. The facial structure differed from a normal human face and looked more like a mannequin face. This human looking figure started opening his eyes. Wake up, Elric. I'm the god of darkness. And I'm here to give you another chance at life. The ancient being declared its identity. It was the god of darkness who ruled over death and eternal abyss. The human finally opened his eyes. It was none other than Elric who had committed suicide and ended his own life after suffering through many traumatic, heartbreaking experiences and one big betrayal throughout his life. The memories of all the noteworthy and memorable experiences of his previous life started coming back to Elric and he didn't move a single bit, his bright body was currently floating in the air by force unknown. He clearly remembered that he died because the unimaginable pain he experienced when his body finally hit the ground was still completely fresh in his memory. He looked in front of him and saw a towering figure his eyesight could not grasp completely. The being calling itself the God of Darkness was so gigantic, huge and vast that even Hunter Delric count not even amount to its fingernail. He squinted his eyes as if trying to look at something that was placed very far away. Um. Can you be any less bigger? I can't even tell how you look. Asked Elric. 
Suddenly, a chaotic burst of deathly aura come from behind him. And he looked back and saw another being half the size of the one standing in front of him, yet still very humongous and staring at him. The gigantic warrior-like entity stared at, at the human as if and wanted to cut the tiny being into millions of pieces. The red iris was visible through that giant figure's helmet and an unimaginably horrifying pressure was exceeded on the humanoid figure. You were tech human. How dare you speak to a god like my master in such manner? You're nothing but a speck of dust and yet to dare to ask a god to adjust himself to your level? Cravel said angrily. Leave it, he's simply not aware of what's happening now. He was dead just few seconds ago. God of Darkness said and quickly shrank his size in the next moment. The resized G.O.D. was still the size of a 10-story building. He looked at Cravel and gestured to resize his appearance as well. Cravel on the other hand still kept looking at Elric with murderous eyes but did follow his master's orders and become half of his original size. That was his limit. Elric let out a sigh of relief and looked at G.O.D. again. Author Let's shorten God of Darkness to G.O.D. as it's kind of unnecessary to repeat over and over. What do you want from me? Elric asked. Elric, I'm the God of Darkness in my world. And I have a task for you. I want you to become my representative in our world and complete a mission. In return, I will give you a chance to live your life again as a human being. A new start where you are completely free from your past. G.O.D. said as if he was bestowing the world's greatest honor on Elric and appeared very godly and magnanimous in his tone. Elric stood rooted on the spot for a minute and took a long breath before replying in a loud voice. Fuck O.F.F. Chapter 4. The Task. Silence. Total utter silence. It felt as if even a man's heart could not beat at this moment. Elric's response left both God of Darkness and Cravel speechless. It struck them like an arrow in the throat and both of them seemed to lose their ability to speak and think at the same time. A few seconds passed away, God of Darkness stared at Elric with a gaze so deep and full of wrath, enough to kill anyone just by looking at them. Suddenly, an extremely horrifying aura exuded out of both God of Darkness and Cravel's bodies. Bang! Unimaginably horrendous killing intent filled the surrounding atmosphere and covered a radius of few dozen kilometers. Even diamonds would be reduced to nothing but small granules under this pressure. Elric, the one being who was actually at the receiving end of it all shuddered and his soul form flickered again and again as if his current form was simply getting wiped out of existence and brought back to life. To Elric, it felt like he had gone through thousands of deaths. This pressure he was enduring had destroyed his current form and rebuilt him again in a nanosecond, only to carry out the process indefinitely. After a minute of such heart-wrenching scenario, God of Darkness and Cravel finally stopped excluding their killing intent and looked at Elric who was barely keeping up his screams in. He just didn't get time to open his mouth and scream or wail. To be precise, he had indeed died few thousand times again in that one minute. But an unknown force kept bringing him back to his previous state. Elric had a hint of exactly what this was. It was the God of Darkness using his powers on Elric after his extremely rude and disrespectful response. God of Darkness retracted his gaze from Elric, it appeared to become extremely dim compared to before. G.O.D. ruled over death and infinite abyss. He was a true God who controlled an aspect of reality. Then G.O.D. gazed at Elric with a look of disappointment and spoke again, Never had I ever seen such an extremely impetuous human before. Even the other gods do not dare to talk to me in such a violent disrespectful manner. Tell me, mortal. What makes you think I really won't wipe you out of existence or torture you for the end of time? G.O.D. questioned Elric. Elric, who had finally gained control over his consciousness looked back at G.O.D. and responded, Then why don't you do it? What makes you think I want to be alive? Just finish the job and end me already. Elric's answer left both G.O.D. and Cravel speechless. Had their act of trying to put Elric into submission by making him experience death over few thousand times turned him into a fool? Or had he gone senile from the pain and suffering to become a suicidal maniac? Cravel who was rendered speechless by Elric since he had said fuck off to G.O.D. looked at his master as if he was looking at someone who broke their favorite toy. 
My liege, are you sure you haven't destroyed his consciousness completely? Cravel asked. G.O.D. was startled at this point and refused by flexing his hands around. Oi, what are you waiting for? Just kill me already. I don't want to spend another second looking at your ugly faces. Elric grumbled in a discontent tone. Ugly your mother. Both G.O.D. and Cravel said in rebuttal. Both of them looked at Elric as if he just killed their dog. Elric on the other end was surprised. These two ultimate beings killed him over a few thousand times for being disrespectful but now they were suddenly throwing rude comments at him for calling them ugly like little girls? Why was this happening? He just wanted to die again and be done with it. At the next second however, G.O.D. decided to end the charade and get back to business. Why do you not want to live again? Is it because of your past life experiences? He asked Elric. Yes. Who wants a second chance at life just to get used up by someone else again? I mean whatever you want me to do comes with a price which definitely won't be beneficial to me at all. And why should I believe in anything you say? Let's save us all the trouble, send me back to being dead and find someone else who actually wants to live. Elric said with a bored expression. G.O.D. and Cravel were taken aback again. So you don't want to live again, mortal? Do you not understand the opportunity my liege is offering you? Not everyone gets such a miraculous chance. Cravel who refrained to be part of this conversation decided to meddle in. Are you two morons dumb? Didn't you hear me the first time? Let me die you, bastards. Fix someone else. Why do you even need to listen to me, just send me back. Elric gave his discontent. I. I can't. G.O.D. finally spoke up. He shook his head and was trying to avoid direct eye contact. My powers allow me to control death and things that have no place in existence. I am a being born out of that very aspect of reality in our world. At most, I can summon the dead souls from other worlds like yours inside this world boundary and only keep just one of such souls in my possession as the dead of other worlds are bound to their respective world's laws of reality. And even keeping one soul here takes an immense amount of my power. G.O.D. explained the whole process. Elric looked at G.O.D. as if he was looking at a liar. Not satisfied with his answer at all. But then he looked at Cravel who was standing beside G.O.D.'s throne. And he too looked like that was indeed the truth. And what if I refuse to do whatever you said you wanted me to do? You'll at least kill me, right? Elric asked with an expectant expression. No. Both G.O.D. and Cravel shouted at the same time. Why? Elric asked, because you're the only one we can rely upon now. And I can no longer summon anyone again for next few thousand years. G.O.D. said. And why should I care? From the looks of it. It looks like some impossible job for a normal office worker guy like me. I didn't live a life of wonders and heroic deeds you know. Why would you even pick me of all the people of you could have picked? Elric asked curiously. This didn't make sense to him as G.O.D. could have easily brought someone more capable and experienced for whatever job they had to be done. So why him? G.O.D. however, stayed silent for a dozen seconds and finally heaved a sigh. He looked at Elric and said, Because the task we are going to give you demands one being extremely aware and not trust anyone. Because currently, all my representatives and anyone who was a lie to me has been marked as someone who must be killed in the entire world of Antri. Including those who once served or worshipped me in the form of cults, temples and churches. Said G.O.D. in a very disheartened tone. I wasn't even supposed to summon you myself. Normally, whenever a chosen one is brought from a different world into ours, they are summoned by the churches and the empire who worship a particular god and follows their doctrine at the expense of hundreds of mages working together. But all my followers and anyone who had worshipped me were wiped out completely more than 200 years ago. And now, no one even knows that I exist. My name is nothing but a myth in our world at this point. G.O.D. explained. Elric who looked at both the beings in front of him with a suspecting gaze still appeared to be uncertain and asked. So what do you want me to do? Build churches and temples for you, spread your divine teachings to the masses and bring you back to your glory days? Sorry, but I'm not a religious guy. 
G.O.D. and Gravel both glanced at each other and gazed at Elric together. No we don't want you to do something so arduous and hectic. We just need you to kill the demon god. Said G.O.D. with an embarrassed tone. As if struck by a thousand bolts of lightning at the same time, Elric stayed rooted on the spot. He didn't speak or move at all. Only after half a minute, he was fumed with anger and shouted, You motherfuckers! Chapter 5 The Reason Silence. Another total silence. Kill the demon god? What the fuck? How was Elric going to do it? From what he heard G.O.D. and Cravel say before, even those who came before him and also the chosen ones of other gods failed to do so and probably they all died including the previous summon who came before Elric. So how was he supposed to do it? Saving the world sounded good only when it was fictional or somebody else did it. Who would waste their life just so they could brag about it? Elric looked at the two ultimate beings who were standing in front of him. His expression was as if they killed his dog. Even Cravel who was even sterner and stone-faced than G.O.D. looking the other way as if he was thinking the weather is very nice today. Both of them were beings who could destroy an entire country with just a wave of their hand but now they were avoiding eye contact with a single human as they felt embarrassed for making such a request. G.O.D. finally dared to look at him and asked, So what do you think? Do you accept our proposal? Elric shouted, No not e. Nay. Nada. Nako. Ni. E. Enemyu. He refused in all the different languages he knew. He sat on the imaginary ground and held his head in both of his hands. He felt like dying one more time. He started hurling abuses at the two godly existences in front of him again. Fuck you. Fuck your mom. Fuck your sister. Fuck your entire family. Elric kept trembling as he started cursing G.O.D. and Cravel's 18 generations of ancestors. Unlike the previous time, both G.O.D. and Cravel didn't exude any killing intent and stood there like little kids who were being scolded by their parents. All they could do was endure with their heads hanging down. After 10 minutes of rambling and cursing, Elric finally stopped as he was thinking of ways to escape his current predicament. What if I don't accept it? You clearly can't make me accept by force and that's why you need my approval. Elric said with a smug face. But G.O.D. spoke again with a calculative expression on his face. You are right. We can't transfer your soul into our world without your permission. However, it's not like you have any other choice either. We're currently inside the world boundary. Look at the dome around us. It's a personal space I created when I summoned the souls from your world. Without it, nothing is supposed to exist in this place. G.O.D. said in a smug tone. Doesn't that mean I'll die if I exit out of this dome? Works for me. Elric said joyfully, that was his main objective for now. To die for good. The next second, G.O.D. shook his head and replied that's not how it works. Nothing is supposed to exist inside this place. If you exit the dome, you'll become part of the world boundary itself and you'll be tied to it forever. You won't be able to leave and you certainly won't die either. You'll be simply bound to this place for the end of time. Why do you think even a god like me had to create this barrier to protect myself? Elric finally came to a realization. It all made sense. He looked around his surroundings again and saw that outside the dome, there really was nothing. No light, no land, no water, not even air, nothing. He thought he might cease to exist if he went outside but after hearing G.O.D. explain it, he found it believable. Why would a little god like God of Darkness need to create a barrier and protect himself from this place? If he could enter it, he could easily leave as well. But if he did have the ability, he wouldn't need to create this dome and protect himself if not being tied to this world boundary was an actual thing that would happen. If Elric went outside the barrier, He'll just become part of this place and exist here till this place was destroyed. Which was simply impossible and wouldn't happen in billions of years to come. And Elric would become insane here. This was literally a fate worse than death. Even the core of his soul shuddered with just a thought of it. He heaved a long sigh and came to terms with his current situation. He can't die, and can't leave this place either. The only way out was with G.O.D. sending him to their world called Vantry. 
It seemed like he really did not have any other choice but to accept their proposal. Fine. I'll do it. As much as I want to die, I don't want to be stuck here and wander till the end of time and go insane. Elric with discomfort spilling out in his voice. Great. It's good that we've come to an agreement. G.O.D. said cheerily. Even Gravel was nodding his head in joy. But. Elric said and stopped his words. He looked at both of them and looked as if he was thinking about something very important. Let me be straight. I don't want to work my ass off just to attempt your task. I mean, Demon God is also a little god just like you, right? Elric asked. Not quite. G.O.D. said as he continued. I and other gods are beings born out of different aspects of reality and laws of existence in our world. We each have perfect control over the laws from which we were manifested from. And we will continue to exist as long as our world exists. However, Demon God was born out of thousands of years of malice and hatred. He is an unnatural being and something that shouldn't exist. If not for the past 10,000 years of wars and bloodshed that kept happening in our world. Something like him wouldn't even come to manifest. He gave a helpless look at Elric and said, We gods can only represent a law of our world and have perfect control over that law. So we can't affect the world or intervene in it directly. We're more like an overseer at this point. And with different species in our world reaching the most prominent time of their civilizations, something like wars for survival, for resources and for the beliefs that were instilled in them by the gods they've worshipped till now, conflict was bound to occur. The past 5,000 years were a testament to its greatest impact in the history of our world. And the demon god, who was born as nothing but an anomaly in our world kept feeding over it and is becoming stronger and stronger again. Even though he is still not even half as strong as any of the 12 gods. At this rate, we think it won't take him even next 100 years before he reaches to our level and establishes his law of existence into our world. G.O.D. finally stopped explaining. Elric, who was a person with actual brains in his previous life quickly understood what G.O.D. was implying. He said, so if what you say is right. After he establishes his law of existence in your world. He'll become a little god like you and the other gods and will become an invincible existence. Impossible to kill unless one can destroy the Who world of Ventry itself. Which also means killing the other gods including you in the process. G.O.D. looked at Elric in approval of his intellect. You were able to infer all that just from few words. He nodded and continued. But that's not all. Since he's an anomaly born out of war, malice and bloodshed inside the whole world. Once he becomes a god like us, he will keep getting stronger till the point none of the twelve gods can stop him. And unlike us, he won't be bound to follow the laws of reality in our world and will be able to interfere in it directly. He can simply wipe out all the living beings and reach to a height where even us gods would be nothing but ants in front of him. Said G.O.D. in a worrying tone. Are you kidding me? How is that even possible? To reach a level above the gods? You're lying. Elric said with a curious manner. I wish that was true. But unlike your world, ours is filled with magic and natural energy so vast that even we gods can't completely control or contain it. And since we also represent different laws of reality, the world rejects us when we try to combine our powers and treats us like an external being. Like an outsider trying to enter your house. We've tried and failed hundreds of times already. And that's why. 3,000 years ago, we gods made a pact to find a solution to end it. And after decades of research, we found a way. To summon beings from other worlds. G.O.D. finally explained the exact reason why Elric was brought in here. So this was the main reason behind it. But I don't understand one thing. Why us humans? Because there must be other superior life forms in the multiverse, right? Elric asked. If I had not read your memories, I wouldn't understand what multiverse meant. G.O.D. said and continued, The thing is, you humans from other worlds have the greatest affinity with the magic and natural energy of our world. In other words, you can become indefinitely stronger as you increase your magical powers and experience with time. 
you lot possess the potential to reach the same level as what you can call a demigod. Just like Gravel over here. G.O.D. finished his words and pointed towards Gravel, his most trusted servant. So you're demigod? Elric asked as he looked towards Gravel with a surprised expression. Yes, I am. But unlike you or the other chosen ones, I'm not from a different world. I was born in our world and reached the level of demigod by my own efforts. It took me thousands of years to accomplish that goal. But unlike the demon god, I'm bound to the laws of our world since I was a natural living being in the first place. So I too can no longer directly intervene in our world's happenings. If demon god was born in the same time as me, I could have killed him myself but it's long time past that. Cravel said and shook his head as he was at a loss. After hearing someone so stubborn as Cravel, Elric understood exactly how grave matter it was. The world was near to an end, and the most supreme beings in it were helpless to do anything to prevent it. And the world itself was rejecting their intervention. It was a very complicated situation itself. No wonder even the gods had to rely on humans summoned from other worlds to do their bidding. Wait, I don't understand one thing though. You said all the gods agreed to kill the demon god together. But then why were your followers boycotted and now declared to be were on the entire world's must kill list? You're not hiding something from me, are you? Elric cast and looked at God of Darkness with a suspicious gaze. At his query, G.O.D. looked at Elric with a helpless expression and said, It's because among the gods, I and God of Light are the strongest. However, I represent death and the end of a living being's existence. And not many in the entire world would wish to worship such a god who thrives on deaths of world's inhabitants, right? G.O.D. said embarrassingly. Out with it. The whole truth. Or you can forget about me accepting your proposal. Elric said in an angered tone. He was no fool. Where there was life, there was bound to be death. But that wasn't a valid reason to despise death itself as it was part of a natural cycle of any living being. Even the most indestructible thing in the world would cease to exist after a time. So whatever G.O.D. was telling Elric wasn't the complete truth. Or it was a complete lie to begin with. G.O.D. was left speechless again. Why was this human so smart? Was it because of his past life experiences that he found everybody untrustworthy? Or was it because he was simply an overly cautious guy? He had no answer. Fine. I'll tell you the truth. G.O.D. said with a furious expression. As long as it's the whole truth. Elric said in a firm tone. It's because my eighth chosen one, the previous summon and your predecessor. He. G.O.D. stopped his words and rested his head back on his throne as if he was lamenting on a bad memory. After a dozen seconds, he continued, he killed all the other chosen heroes. Hi. This is Novel Admire. Thanks for the visit. Chapter 6. The Choice. Another pin drop silence. Elric couldn't believe what G.O.D. just revealed to him. Another mind-boggling plot twist. First, it was fighting against Demon God and now that his predecessor killed the chosen heroes of the other gods. Just hearing this made Elric regret his decision to agree with God of Darkness's proposal. Now he understood why the entire world of Venturi had issued a kill on sight order for those who followed, worshipped God of Darkness and were wiped out three centuries ago. It was his predecessor who basically made an enemy out of the entire world and now had implicated Elric as well. Oi? Tell me that's a lie. That joke is not even funny. Elric said as he still had not come to accept the truth. It was understandable as every religious branch or empire would cherish the chosen heroes which were to complete the task ordered by their god and treat them with the utmost care, hospitality and respect. And to have them killed. Not just one of them but all eleven of these heroes by one who was tasked with the same mission as them. No wonder all the ruling authorities regardless of their qualms and indifferences with each other would be united to massacre the main party responsible and anyone associated with them. And that is why God of Darkness and his followers have been rooted out of annals of history 300 years ago. Doesn't that mean I'll be killed off as soon as I enter your world and somebody knows my real identity as your chosen hero? Elric asked with a pitiful face. He had just reached the peak of the mountain, only to fall straight inside a volcano. 
fuck, my bad luck won't leave me even in my second life. Elric lamented on his extremely disastrous luck. And he had no other choice to do it anyway or he'll be forever stuck inside the world boundary. Now what? How am I even supposed to kill the demon god? You just raised the game difficulty from hell mode to impossible mode. This is beyond hopeless already. I don't think that I can do it even if I had 10 more lives. Elric said with a depressed expression on his face. If he wasn't in his soul form now, he'd already be shedding tears. Naturally you'll have to conceal that fact. Until you're strong enough to face the entire world by your own at least. G.O.D. said as if this was something very normal. Elric rolled his eyes. Facing the world by yourself? Does he think it's that easy? Wouldn't this entail that Elric will have to live like a criminal, a thief, a prey running away as he would be constantly hunted down by the entire world? Don't worry. I naturally have the means to conceal your arrival. Neither gods nor their followers would be able to detect it. Also, the fact that your original body being destroyed would become our advantage. G.O.D. said, trying to comfort Elric who seemed on the verge of committing suicide again. What do you mean? What does that have to do with my original body? Elric asked. All the gods and their followers always have to go through a grand ceremony with hundreds of magicians partaking in the summoning ritual. Even for our world where magical energy is flowing in abundance, breaking the world barrier and summoning a person takes a huge amount of magic. That is enough to cause a spike in the magical energy of the world, noticeable even from 10 kilometers. And that's why every summon is accounted for. On top of that, they all come with their original bodies in our world. Unlike you, whose body was reduced to dust after your death. G.O.D. explained the whole ordeal as Elric didn't have any knowledge or information on how things worked in the world of Vantry. G.O.D. then continued, and me being the one summoning you is also the major factor. Other gods can't summon the souls of the dead from other worlds at all. I'm the only one who can do it since I'm the manifestation of death and darkness. Bringing something like a soul of someone deceased is not even worth mentioning. Other gods can at most. Open the world boundary and take a peek at the world they intend to summon a chosen hero from. G.O.D. said with a smug smile as he reveled in the sense of superiority he was feeling because of his specialty. Um. Then how do I enter your world without a body? Don't tell me I'm going there in this form. Like a ghost or a wraith? Elric wondered and asked. Naturally, we'll have to construct a new body for you. Or I can simply put your soul inside of someone who died just a few hours ago. Take your pick. G.O.D. spoke like a true professional and flicked his imaginary glasses with his forefinger. Author, inserts Subarashi meme, wait. You said before that we humans have the highest affinity with magic in your world. Even if I were to go in a new body or transfer it inside someone else's body, wouldn't I be just a normal person and weaker compared to other heroes? Elric asked, making a valid point. Not exactly. I've done my research over decades about this matter. And I found that it's not the physical body but your soul. Compared to the inhabitants of our world, your souls are brighter like a midday sun. And not only that, they can also absorb and accumulate magical and natural energy over time. And hence you can become as strong as a demigod. The physical body is just a convenient medium. G.O.D. explained, revealing his knowledge-seeking mind when it came to death and souls. Elric who had come to terms with his upcoming fate started thinking about these two options. So can you really construct me a body out of nothing? I won't be reborn as an undead or a skeleton, right? Elric asked. He had to be cautious here, otherwise who knows if he'd become undead or a walking talking skeleton who would be killed at first sight by anyone he met. That death won't even be worth pitying, rather anyone who heard about it would roll on the floor laughing their ass off. Who do you think you're talking to? Even though I'm not god of life, I do possess that power. And not only that, I can make you a body of your specifications. No matter what color, height or build you want. I am an expert at that. G.O.D. started flexing about his useless talent as if he was doing a great honor to Elric. In the next moment however, 
Elric who had been mostly curious till now looked extremely shocked and suddenly there was a greedy and evil grin on his face. This whole thing meant that he could finally achieve that ideal body he always dreamt of in his previous life. The body of a Greek god or one of those superhero movie actors he looked up to for body aesthetics. But Elric didn't show the excitement on his face. Instead, he appeared as if he was giving it a good thought. And asked again, and what about the second option? Would I have the memories of the person I'm transmigrated in? At this query, G.O.D. responded quickly. No something like possessing someone's memories is tied to their soul. Once you die and your soul leaves the mortal body, there is no connection of consciousness left. So you won't inherit the memories of the previous occupant. However, I don't think I need to remind you about how you'll be tied to that person's past and people they once knew. And since you can't reveal that you're no longer that person and someone else, you'll have to play the part. But this does have its advantages. I can't transfer you inside the body of someone who is a very influential person in our world. Like a royalty or even an emperor if we have the options available. So think about it carefully. G.O.D. said and left Elric to think about it alone. A dozen minutes passed. Elric was lost in his thoughts. Continuously thinking about the pros and cons of both scenarios. If he chose to go with a newly made body of his choosing. He will not have any ties to anyone and would be free to do anything he wanted. He won't have to answer to anyone and could easily fake out his background as well if someone asked him. This could help him in the long run, aside from the most obvious advantage of having a perfectly made body of his own. But on the other hand, he'd be penniless, there would be no one he knows or have any means to get settled quickly. He'd be homeless, backgroundless, would know nothing about the world and nobody to help him in his journey to do the impossible task of killing the demon god. The other option however, gave him a lot of advantages. Like if he chose the body of someone very influential or someone who had the access to a lot of resources at their beck and call, that'd save him tons of trouble. He could simply be reborn in the body of some prince who died, an emperor who was close to death, or a great general or an aristocrat who was respected by everybody. If these choices were available to them that is. This would enable him to adjust himself very quickly inside the world of Vantry and also let him focus on his main goal without having to struggle just to establish himself in the world. But just like the first option, this one also had a lot of disadvantages of its own. For example, if he were to be transmigrated inside someone who once held a huge authority before their death. Naturally there would be a lot of explaining to do about how he came back to life. And since he wouldn't inherit the memories of the previous owner, he won't know anyone except the people the original owner was close to. And if he feigns some lie or something like losing his memories, that'd also mean that the new body of that person will hold no power for the time being. Rather, others would try to get rid of him on the accords of having him lost all his memories. Or even claim that he made a deal with the devil. What's next will be a grand crucifixion in the central street of the city. Plus there would be issues regarding the health and state of the original body such as old age or any former disease or illness or the body being too weak. Also the connection with other people. Like if he were to be born in the body of an old man, he'd have a wife, children, and grandchildren to deal with. If he was born as a kid or a teen, even if that was a prince of a country. The actual power he'd hold will be in the name only. And nationally, Elric will have to deal with the hassle of political issues and drama as the heir or a sign of a king, emperor. There was too much unnecessary burden that will be thrown at him. And because of these advantages and disadvantages, Elric was thinking very carefully about what would be the best choice. And at the same time, he was thankful to God of Darkness for at least offering him the choice. Otherwise, he had read plenty of mangas, novels and manhwas where the main character just gets thrown inside the body of someone else and has no other choice but to live like them or suffer through the problems they've been going through. Elric straight up hated that scenario even in stories where you just suddenly wake up as someone else and find yourself at odds and have to go through a lot of nonsense. Elric, who also had once fallen in this cycle knew the story setting and patterns well. He had come to realize them after years of voraciously feeding his brain about these stories. 
like hell he was going to live one of those loosely based storylines only appealing to little children and newbies who just entered the world of fantasy and fictional stories. To put it in a word, Elric was a god and war veteran compared to these people. He had the experience of a decade and a half living that very life. He had seen through it all, he had lived through it all. Let it be TV shows, superhero movies, reading mangas, manhwas, manhwas, novels and other stuff. He had an eidetic memory so he was a walking talking ancient archive of all of these stories and the information. What he knew was just beyond comprehension. After overthinking all the possible scenarios and their consequences, Elric finally made up his mind. He looked towards God of Darkness with a resolute gaze and said, First choice. Elric said and folded his arms together. Really? Why not the second? It is the most beneficial and will save you the hassle. Didn't you say that you don't want to work too much and waste your life on it? G.O.D. asked as he was puzzled by Elric's choice. He too was new at this because his previous chosen heroes were summoned exactly the same way as the heroes of the other gods. Although he had the ability to personally summon someone from another world, he never actually had a need or a reason to. So he assumed that Elric would decide on the easy and smoother way. But to his surprise, Elric chose the most unconventional way here. Because there were just too many odds against him in the first choice scenario. If he himself was in Elric's position, he'd obviously take the second option. Too many complicated reasons. You wouldn't understand even if I told you all of them. I'd rather do this whole thing on my own terms. And since when I have been dependent on others or cared about what others think of me? Something like family, friends, lovers or a community holds no value if you take away the reason for their existence. Only because of responsibilities, need, order or liabilities are these relationships and bonds formed. In the first choice, I'll be free of it all. And I won't have to look after anyone else but myself and I definitely won't be doing the same mistakes as my past life where I had no choice to begin with. This time, I'll choose everything on my own accords. This time, I will be in complete control of my own life. Elric said, his expression was oozing out his determination. Strange indeed. If any of your predecessors were in your place, they would have chosen the second option. You on the other hand, taking an unconventional turn is surprising to me as well said God of Darkness. G.O.D. turned his gaze back to Elric and said. Fine. Now time to decide your divine abilities. Chapter 7. The Selection. The moment of truth has come. After all the discussion and decisions, it was the most important part of this whole arrangement. Because it will decide exactly how Elric would be able to plan his path towards achieving his goals. Because these divine abilities were not just going to be his way to gain strength, rather they'd be his cheat codes. Elric who had the knowledge of a majority of such scenarios where a reincarnated person in mangas and novels would be granted such abilities in these stories. But because of his experience, he had read a lot of these stories and knew where would any type of such so-called divine abilities lead him in the future. So he had to look through all of these carefully and choose the most suitable ones based on his situation when he'll be thrown in sooner in the world of Vantry. Since he had to choose them beforehand, he naturally had to look for the most useful ones with the greatest potential. The ones which would not only help him become stronger but also become his trump card and save his life whenever he was in a situation where he could most definitely die again. Though it would have been most preferable by the Elric of the past but now that he was going to give his life another chance, he had to make it easier and convenient as much as he could. These abilities would not only enable him to accomplish the end game, but also shape his future. I'm ready. Show me said Elric. You're allowed to choose only two divine abilities. Every god gives them to their heroes. And each god possesses their unique divine abilities related to their law of existence. However, you won't get to choose these powers again. So you must think about it very carefully. G.O.D. said and waved his left hand. Suddenly over fifty huge monoliths as big as a house appeared in front of Elric and started lining up in a queue. Some of them emitted gold, some silver and some bronze light coming out of them as if they were classified in tiers based on their usefulness. However, 
There were also three dark ones that didn't emit any light at all. More like they were sucking in the nearby light in them. Elric understood that these were the abilities he'd be granted after choosing and his future approach towards his goal will be dependent on them. He looked at these portraits and the information about their use and how to use them started flowing in his mind. Mind control, summoning undead, teleportation, telekinesis, telepathy, levitation, integration, mimic, clairvoyance, sage's eye. Around 50 of such random abilities appeared on each of these monoliths and all of them were in their utmost big grade. They were simply perfect without any flaws. Elric started touching each of these monoliths with his hand and somehow, he was feeling an innate connection towards them. He felt like each one of these divine abilities were calling out to him and asking him to accept them. But Elric didn't stop or fell for the temptation, he sternly kept browsing through all of them one by one. He could not afford to mess it up. After some time, he had browsed through all the gold, silver and bronze monoliths. He curiously asked. What's with the bright lights? Why are they shining in different colors? G.O.D. simply looked at Elric and said, Gold's ones are the most chosen ones by your predecessors. Like at least four times for the two slots they were given. Silver ones three times and bronze ones two times. What about those black ones? Elric asked. Not even once. G.O.D. replied. All these abilities are simply amazing and can be used for extremely favorable outcomes. No wonder my predecessors chose many of these. If used properly, they can even help me create an empire of my own and reach at the strength enough to fight against the demon god within a decade or two. Simply astounding. Elric nodded in approval. But in the next second, he retorted however, all of them are bound to certain conditions. For example, mind control. I will need to keep looking in a person's eyes for at least a minute and have a suggestive conversation to control their minds to work for me or do my bidding. At the time of fight for life and death, it won't be useful at all because the enemy obviously won't be interested in settling things with words. And the necromancer ability. Needs me to rob graveyards to make the deceased part of my summoned army. Too useful for the future but also very tedious. Clairvoyance can only see through a certain time in the future but can't be used consequently, I'll need to wait for a few hours to use it again. Great potential, it can also save me from being tricked by others and stop my possible death as well. But still, the conditions to use it lacks potential as it will only give me a head start but not actually help me change the situation. Telekinesis has restrictions on distance or how far my reach is and also how much weight I can lift or exert through it. Would have been too up if I could move a mountain with it. Sage's eye only gives out information about everything as long as it's not of divine rank or the information is sealed by the gods themselves. But what use could I make of it if I don't have enough skills or means to use such information to get an upper hand? Telepathy needs me to at least once touch the person I want to read minds of or establish a mind link. Will definitely help me look like a creep and a pervert for sure. Elric gave a thumb up to G.O.D., and then he started listing out all the bothersome terms and conditions of these divine abilities which were subject to market risks. G.O.D. who once had a prideful face when he showed these abilities to Elric and expected a face of awe and worship was left speechless. These were the goddamn divine abilities for G.O.D.'s sake. Author, see what I did there. Lol, and this guy was complaining how they were inconvenient and only useful for certain situations with no flexible uses. He had indirectly flipped a middle finger to G.O.D. himself who once presented all these abilities to all his summons that came before Elric. G.O.D. for the first time in his billions of years of existence felt like crying. Elric was basically kicking him in the face over and over. And each time, the intensity was increasing more than before. Even Cravel gave G.O.D. a look full of pity. Why don't you create your own divine abilities then? G.O.D. could only retort in his mind. Saying it out loud would only diminish his image as an almighty god who was triggered just by few words of a dead man's soul. Just as he was about to speak. Elric turned his gaze to the three dark monoliths and started checking them out. Ability Absorption Dimensional Law Synthesis 
Just as the information about these three divine abilities was fully processed by Elric's mind, he was out of words. He read through them and an expression of puzzlement appeared on his face. The abilities had details on them such as, divine ability, ability absorption, allows the owner of the divine ability to absorb the physical and magical abilities of the targeted being without any complications or side effects to the owner. However, the owner will still have to follow through with the restrictions and terms of use for these individual abilities. Condition the target whose abilities are to be absorbed must be dead before using this ability on them. Otherwise, the absorption will be a failure. And the target must not have been dead for too long and the physical body must be in a shape enough to completely extract these abilities should they entail having something such as blood requirements or body parts. There will be a failure if the target's body is destroyed beyond measure or the required quantity needed for ability absorption is inadequate. Then he read the second divine ability, divine ability, dimensional law, the owner of this divine ability has access to all the space and void around them. They can open the void and enter it without any harm to the physical body. Also allows a part of the body to be placed inside the void at the same time while the rest of the body exists in the real world without harming the original body. The distance of travel and time user can stay inside the void increases with the increase in mastery of the law. Condition, the owner must be extremely efficient in the space magic and law. This divine ability is only accessible when the owner has met the prerequisite conditions. Then he moved to the third divine ability, divine ability, synthesis, allows the owner to recreate two different physical abilities and magic skills to form a new variant based on the working principles of the abilities and skills in the synthesis procedure. Abilities created will have no side effects on the owner's body or mental condition. This ability can also be used to create creatures by mixing different sets of beings and abilities. Condition Certain levels of prerequisite conditions, such as physical ability and skills required for the process, must be met before synthesis can be done. The strength and specialty of the creatures created will depend upon the base subjects they were experimenting with. Elric was out of words again. These three abilities were something he did not expect to be here on the list. He understood why his predecessors didn't choose these three divine abilities even once. The required conditions for them were indeed very troublesome and hard to achieve. But Elric was different from all of them. Unlike those who came before him, they were all either great tacticians, great leaders, or generals of their respective countries and their era. But none of them had the experience of being an otaku a nerd and a geek. So naturally, they found these three abilities extremely useless and hard to cultivate. From a normal person's perspective, all of these were not worth choosing at all. As they needed a lot of time to be perfected and definitely a lot of time would be wasted just to meet the perquisites of these divine abilities. For example, they will always have to kill someone or a monster to absorb their abilities. They will have to learn and understand space and time law which was easier said than done. And synthesis ability will surely have a lot of restrictions upon it when trying to merge two different abilities and creatures as well. So in the long run, these three divine abilities would give them more trouble, waste their time which would hinder their path to becoming stronger and even make things complicated as they will have to do their research and spend a lot of time on it as well. So these abilities were the worst options available. But in the next minute, Elric looked at God of Darkness and said, I want them. I want all three of them. To his decision, both G.O.D. and Cravel looked at him together and shouted, Are you out of your God and mind? Chapter 8, True Identity God of Darkness and Cravel kept staring at Elric as if they were looking at a madman. They were out of wits on why would Elric choose these divine abilities which were most complicated, very time-consuming to develop and very difficult to gain mastery over. There was a reason why these divine abilities were untouched and not even considered by all the previous eight chosen heroes who came before Elric. But not only did he want to choose these oddities, he also wanted all three of them. Which was against the rules set by the gods. What's there to be surprised about? I have my reasons to choose these three. You chose me out of those millions of souls because you needed someone different to complete the mission, right? Well, these three are the ones I want. 
There aren't going to be alternatives and I won't change my mind. Elric said with a firm and resolved tone. Mortal, why must you choose these three abilities out of them all? There are many divine abilities that can make you very strong in a short amount of time. Not only will they save you a lot of time, they'll also help you create an influence in our world to the point where no empire or church will dare to declare an open war with you when you reveal your identity to the world. So why must you waste this chance on the most ignored divine abilities in the past 3000 years? Kravel decided to ask out of his utmost curiosity towards Elric's decision. As I said before, if it was anyone else who came before me, they'd definitely choose the other divine abilities. But I'm not them and my circumstances are different from them. Because none of them were going to hunt it down by the entire world. Unlike them, I can't walk around people openly and declare that I'm the chosen hero of God of Darkness. There's no one coming to my aid and no one is going to provide for me or look after me. Unlike the other abilities, these three can help me hide, survive and become stronger behind the shadows and no one will notice or try to uncover my identity. Elric explained. His reasoning was right as none of his predecessors were in the same situation as him. And this made him consider his options based on practicality than just becoming stronger in a short time. Besides, you still don't know the potential of these three divine abilities at all. Let me put it in simple words. Though they're all complicated and hard to complete mastery over, the number of outcomes I can achieve are simply unimaginable. Not only they can help me get stronger bit by bit without raising the suspicion of the others, but they will also ensure my survival to the most degree. Something I need the most after I enter your world. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. Elric replied, refusing to go into too many details. Only he knew exactly what potential did these three divine abilities had. Ability absorption was one of the most meta abilities he had seen in hundreds of novels, mangas and animes. Of course, who didn't know about a 35-year-old guy getting reincarnated as a slime in another world with a similar ability just like ability absorption which helped him get stronger by devouring his enemies and monsters and reach to a level where even the strongest beings in that new world had to acknowledge him and even slightly be wary of him. Of course, he was thinking about Rimuru Tempest from that time I got reincarnated as a slime. So when he saw ability absorption, the first thing Elric thought was how lucky he was and he had already hit the jackpot. But to put an icing on the cake, he saw the second divine ability, Dimensional Law. Any anime fan who watched Naruto and had enough information about it knew of one guy who put the entire world at a war just by himself. And he possessed the same ability similar to Dimensional Law which would allow him to have one part of his body exist in a separate dimension so when his enemies attacked him, He'd simply face them head on and take his even straight at his heart just to have enemy's weapon pass right through him while he used that opportunity to kill his enemies by catching them off guard. Elric thought of none other than Abido Akai from Naruto Shippuden. But the awesomeness of dimensional law didn't end here. This divine ability allowed him to open a crack in the void and hide in it for the time being. And with time as his mastery progressed, he could also travel inside the void and exit out of it somewhere else. So in simple words, there was no actual place that could completely trap him or a place he couldn't enter with this divine ability. For example, he could get out of prison whenever he wanted or get inside a highly protected castle to kill someone and no one will ever find him. Obviously, Elric won't be able to achieve such results with his non-existent mastery over space and time law, but with time he could envision himself achieve that feat as well. And to fill your stomach with delicious food. There was the third divine ability, Synthesis. Since Elric wasn't going to have an op system like many protagonists who get reincarnated in another world which would guide them, help them become stronger and give them rewards like epic swords or equipment, create stuff out of nowhere and things that shouldn't belong in that world based on its settings such as culture, technology and scientific advancement. He needed a way to ensure his safety and find a reliable way that won't just help him become stronger but rather way to up. And Synthesis was offering him just that. By using ability absorption, he could gain both physical abilities and magical skills of his targets. But that's all there ever will be. 
he will naturally have to look for way too stronger enemies to learn badass abilities and skills. And they will vary from each other as well. But with Synthesis Divine Ability, not only could he merge the abilities he already learned, but he could also use it to merge different beings. For example, he could simply kill a monster, gain their abilities and then later use that monster to merge with another monster to create his own version. Which will not be any weaker than the former, rather even more powerful. And Elric felt that these creations of his would naturally be loyal to him. Otherwise, Synthesis would not be called a divine ability if his own creations tried to kill him instead. With this ability, not only he could create a small army of monsters or people for him, he could also create new beings which he may need to do a specific task or job which required them to have a specific type of skills and physical advantage. In the future, he could just create an op army of his creations with time which could become comparable to the army of shadow soldiers of a certain Korean hunter. All Elric needed was just time to get stronger and experiment with these abilities. He naturally believed that this wasn't the only use of these three divine abilities. This was more likely just the cover of the book. And there would be far many more applications and different uses that remain to be explored. Compared to the other divine abilities, these were not as easy or convenient as other divine abilities but the potential was simply unimaginable. And if he were to fight someone like Demon God on even terms, he needed not only just one form of power but everything he could find and make use of in the world of Vantry. If he wanted to stay alive at the end of the fight that is. Because all the predecessor chosen heroes of the Twelve Gods had already made it obvious that they all failed to kill him no matter how strong they had become. Elric didn't believe that all of them were stupid and ran into a fight to the death with the demon god without preparing beforehand about every single aspect of the battle and how they were going to emerge victorious. At this time, G.O.D. finally decided to speak up. Even if I were to comply with your decision, I still need to remind you that you can only choose two divine abilities. Not more than that. To his reply, Elric gave him an expression of pity instead. Are you stupid? G.O.D. was startled and then the next second, he was enraged. What did you just say? Do you think I won't torture you for the end of time just because I have no choice but to choose you as my chosen hero? G.O.D. spoke angrily. To his spine-chilling voice, Elric replied. Think about it. You said that this is probably going to be the last chance the gods have to kill the demon god before he becomes a full-fledged god like you. So do you really believe that the other gods are going to keep their word and give only two divine abilities to their heroes? For all I know, they'd be giving them at least four to five divine abilities just to increase their winning chances. After all, whichever god's hero kills the demon god, he or she would become the entire world's savior. And that would bring fame to that god's name. Fame big enough to have many living beings in the world to start worshipping that god. So obviously they won't be holding back. Don't tell me you gods are bound to keep your word for a verbal pact? Ha <laughs> ha, Elric explained his reasons for calling G.O.D. stupid. And even the god of darkness was left speechless suddenly realized that Elric was right. Given the fact that this was their last chance, no one was going to hold back no matter how much they wanted to honor their pact. And like Elric said, the winner would be literally worshipped by the entire world and the god who brought them would become the entire world's most famous and worshipped god. Even for someone like God of Darkness who was hated and now forgotten by the entire world, this could bring back his former glory overnight. He too was tired and irritated by the constant mockery and benders of the other gods because of the actions of his previous chosen hero. He could not kill them just as they could not kill him. So he wanted to say suck it. To them as well. This was also a great opportunity for having one up on all the other gods. But he wasn't a fool. He looked at Elric and said, three should be the maximum amount of divine abilities you should choose. Because these abilities will be embedded into your soul and need a fraction of your soul essence to keep functioning. With time, your soul will get stronger in our world. But so will the consumption of soul essence. Any more than three divine abilities and it'll adversely affect your soul and your future strength. Since the other gods aren't any knowledgeable about death and souls like me, 
I'm sure those idiots will give four to five divine abilities to their heroes. G.O.D. replied as the gran appeared on his face because of the fact that other gods were going to suffer a huge misfortune. He liked the idea of it. Fine. I agree with you. You can have all three of these. G.O.D. said and the three house-sized monoliths exploded into millions of pieces and three orbs of pure energy came out of them. All three of these orbs quickly came in contact with Elric's soul form and started merging with him. In just a minute, they completely merged with his soul form and no traces of them were all left. They all had completely unified with Elric. Now, it is time for us to prepare your body. And then you can enter Ventry. G.O.D. said with a little bit of excitement. But just when he was about to speak again, Elric spoke again. Wait. Elric looked towards Cravel this time and asked. Aren't you going give me something as well? Elric asked. What? Why would I give you something, mortal? Hasn't my liege already given you three divine abilities? Cravel asked in a puzzled tone. That's not enough. Given the dire situation we're in. It'll hardly help me out. Or is it that you don't want to help me? Don't tell me all your grand display of loyalty and respect is just for the show. And you don't want to help in your liege getting back to his glory days? Elric asked in a provocative tone. He questioned Cravel's loyalty with the purpose of riling him up. What did you say, mortal? Cravel was angered to his core. Even red fumes were coming out of his glowing red eyes from inside of his helmet. I'm just saying. If it was anyone else in your position, they would have offered to provide extra help for their master without a question. I'm just surprised that you didn't. Elric said as a look of disappointment appeared in his eyes. He shook his head. You dare? I'll show you my loyalty towards my liege. Don't look down on me, mortal. Cravel said as he regained his composure. And in the next second, Six different ancient symbols of different sizes and colors appeared in front of Cravel and started moving towards Elric who was in his soul form. Quickly all these ancient symbols started entering inside him and one by one, they appeared around different parts of his soul form. As if they were some ancient runes engraved on his body. The next second, Elric's mind received the information about what exactly were these ancient symbols and what did he actually receive. Holy fuck. Elric said to himself. He looked at Cravel with the utmost respect for the first time. Because of the information he received also informed him about who Cravel was. Elric only knew that Cravel was a demigod, but nothing more than that. But after he received the information in his head, he finally found out the true title of Cravel. Elric now finally understood that the being wasn't just some lackey of God of Darkness but a being who would be respected and feared from no matter where he went. The ancient symbols were actually blessings that were bestowed upon Elric. And through their description, he saw the name. Cravel, the war deity, dot, 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 dot. Author's note, I know that few chapters have been stretched far longer than needed but this is the only chance I'll get to set a proper background for everyone and the why so that readers can understand why would any character act and behave the way they're going to, such as our protagonist for example. A lot of details and references were shared on the divine abilities because I wanted the readers to get a hint at what they should expect or what's to come on the menu. But no worries, from the next chapter. There won't be any outstretched talks or reasoning explained for the plot. Chapter 9 The Arrival Yes, the war deity. The god Amid African war deity. The being standing in front of him was the one who reached the level of a demigod by mastering all forms of war, all types of weapons and all types of combat techniques. Otherwise, he wouldn't have earned that title at all. If there was a title of god of war, Cravel would be it. As soon as Elric came to know Cravel's real identity as the war deity, he started looking at him differently. As someone who grew up reading books about great warriors of their era on Earth and then later getting hooked up on war-related novels and other forms of platforms, Elric had developed a form of respect towards such individuals. These were the real men. Elric diverted his attention towards the blessings he received and he was left speechless again. Blessings of the War Deity 1. War dominance, active, emits an aura of dominance and supremacy five times stronger than the targeted enemy. 
no matter how strong or weak the targeted being is. The pressure and murderous aura will be sensed by all those who stand in the perimeter of the host. The area affected will keep increasing with an increase in the host's personal strength and emotions. 2. Weapon Mastery, Passive, Mastery over all weapons and things that could be used as a weapon. The mastery over all weapons existing in the world keeps increasing with the level of host strength. Current level, a rank, master level, passive, example, for swordsmanship, the host is already at a level of a sword master. Mastery levels, amateur, intermediate, expert, master, grandmaster, saint, deity. 3. Combat techniques mastery, passive. Grants the user knowledge and experience over all forms of close combat techniques. Also allows user to understand and copy any target's combat techniques after practicing them. Current rank, master, in unknown combat techniques by the war deity, mastery increases only when the user practices and performs these techniques to meet certain understanding and experience. 4. Survival instinct, passive grants the ability to sense extreme danger and killing intent directed towards the user. The range of this ability will keep increasing as the user gets stronger. Note, ability is upgradable and can be merged with other similar abilities. 5. Berserk God Mode, Active, allows user to achieve 5 times the physical strength and stamina for a short time. Note, not applicable to magical skills or mana capacity. The host will be in a weakened state, only having 30% of the user's strength, for the next 24 hours after the activation period ends. 6. War Deity Body, Passive, grants a body capable of becoming two times stronger than the previous stage every time the user goes through long and tiring battles and breaks the threshold of his capabilities. After going through the blessings he received, Elric simply forgot how to speak. Because what Cravel gave him wasn't just mastery of weapons or abilities to dominate his enemies in battle. What he gave him was the biggest head start anyone will ever get if they were thrown into an unknown world. Elric was born with a weak body and never had physical training at anything. Not even normal sports or self-defense techniques. He could hold a sword in a video game or in his dreams only. Hell. He didn't even know how to properly hold a sword either without looking like an idiot or ending up hurting himself instead. Unlike what God of Darkness gave him through the three divine abilities he chose. These blessings wouldn't just help him become stronger or help him survive. Rather, they'd be far more useful than just gaining abilities or creating his army who will serve him. With these blessings, He'd save years of time spent on learning and practicing different types of weapons and how best to use them. Also learning combat techniques was no joke. It took many people dozens of years to perfect them or reach just the rank of a master. But not only Elric would already have built-in knowledge and understanding of these, but he'd also be proficient right when he entered Vantry. He was already at master rank which was way just unbelievable for a guy like him who never had an actual combat experience or killed anyone in his life. Survival instinct would help him sense if someone was targeting him from behind or following him from the shadows. That way he could be prepared to face a sudden attack or an ambush and might as well dodge a sudden arrow shot at his head. This was just too useful in his opinion. Survival instinct was something developed only by people with decades of experience in hunting or someone who had been through thousands of battles in their life. For someone like Elric who would be hunted down sooner or later if the word of his true identity as chosen hero of God of Darkness were to be leaked, survival instinct would save his life on many occasions. Not on just the battlefield, but it will also alert him in random and normal places if someone far stronger than him was targeting or wanted to harm him based on their killing intent. He'd know whom not to fight with and simply need to run away for his life. And there was also Berserk God Mode. Like the description implied, he'd be five times stronger for a short time and it could save his life when he was truly in a pinch. Let's say somehow his dimensional law ability didn't work or he couldn't escape inside the void for some reason such as the surrounding area being sealed by spatial law or some type of barrier or formation, Elric would be left at the mercy of fate. But with Berserk God Mode, 
he'd receive a huge spike in his strength and it could be helpful enough to let him escape or even face his enemy head on who could be much stronger than him. This was a life-saving cheat code indeed. And let's not even talk about war deity body. This thing would just make him a total T-Rex compared to other heroes of the other gods. Because whether he liked it or not, Elric would be put in situations where he'd need to fight someone in authority like forces of the Empire or even people from the church operating in that empire given his identity. He could see himself clashing against the other chosen heroes in the future because they too would be well informed about the act of his predecessor, the eighth chosen hero of God of Darkness. So these heroes will naturally think of him as someone serving the evil or someone they had to exact revenge upon for their predecessors. So, with the war deity body he'd become twice as stronger every time he went past his limits, which naturally will require him to fight a lot of battles and go beyond his capabilities and also will be rare on very rare occasions, most likely in the battle for life and death. But this can give him an upper hand over the other heroes in terms of physical strength alone. So it will also be extremely helpful in the near future. Elric finally broke out of his face state and looked at Cravel again. He didn't hold any of his mocking or disappointed expression and said, I take my words back. After saying so, he bowed towards Cravel with utmost sincere expression. Cravel was left with a puzzled expression again, inside his helmet. This mortal was questioning his loyalty towards his liege not a minute ago and now retracted his statement and bowed half his body in front of him. Cravel, who was of the size of five stories building at the moment could see Elric's way of showing respect. God of Darkness humped slightly without showing the jealousy he was feeling. Because Elric didn't do that to him so far at all. Instead, he said fuck off, bastard, motherfucker, stupid moron and many things he forgot to count. And because of this, Cravel was happy with Elric again. He said, stand up. No need for such formalities. Anyway, did you like my blessings? Cravel asked without masking the smugness in his tone. Elric simply nodded like a puppy in response. Well then, here's something else. It's not a blessing but some of my knowledge you will find very useful while venturing inside Vantry. Cravel said. Soon, a divine formation appeared over Elric's soul form in light made of different and bright colors descended towards his head. Elric started processing the gift he received. As he opened his eyes, he was again left with a joyful expression on his face. What he received wasn't any ability or skills. For the first time, he received a form of information and knowledge that he would be needing no matter where he went knowledge of all languages in the world of Vantry. Elric had worries about this from the beginning, just that he didn't speak about it at all. He was going into a different world. Where existed different cultures, races, species, different regions and things he didn't even know about yet. So naturally, this world wasn't going to be some place where everybody for some reason spoke in English. He was certain that God of Darkness and Cravel weren't talking with him in English either as their gestures and body language acted very differently in accordance with their words and tone. They were using some type of magic or conversed with him using a telepathic connection. Many manga and novel authors always skip this part in their work. In their stories, even the most ancient civilizations which existed tens of thousands of years ago also spoke in English. As if this wasn't a different world but a Hollywood movie where even Wakandans spoke in English despite having their own mother tongue. What Cravel gifted him had saved tons of trouble as not only he would be able to converse with people inside Van Tree, he'd be able to communicate with, understand all the residents and species existing that resided in those regions. This also included understanding various types of languages whether in form of verbal speech or writing so he won't be lost in the world if he went somewhere unknown. After calculating everything that has happened so far ever since his reincarnation, Elric found himself extremely lucky. He was going to get another chance at life despite him refusing and wanting to die again. Neither was he randomly thrown into a different world without any prior knowledge nor suddenly woke up inside someone else's body. He was given a choice to even choose in which way he was going to enter inside Vantry. And unlike hundreds of reincarnated people in the stories he read, 
he was actually clear on his goal and how he will make his approach. Although he wasn't given some op system or someone like Sol Remnant of some heaven-defying monster's will to accompany him on his journey, he still had the option to choose his divine abilities and had the time to plan how he will ensure his survival. He received enough superficial information about Ventry and how things work there. And what not to do if he wanted to stay alive. Cravel's blessings gave him the biggest head start and also an upper hand against those who will be or already were summoned inside the world of Vantry. So he can fight against them as well if the situation arose. After evaluating everything happened so far, Elric was content and truly happy. It felt like fate or destiny, whatever it was called tried to make amends for his former life which he didn't find worth living at all. This time, he was given the choice in which way he will live his new life. Elric wanted nothing more than freedom and control over his own fate. He looked at God of Darkness and Cravel and said, I'm ready. God of Darkness and Cravel both nodded at him. Have you thought of how your new body should look like? After we're done with that, I can send you inside our world. G.O.D. asked. Elric then started giving him specifications of his new body and after one hour of going over every minute detail and many reados, Elric's final physical body was ready. For some reason, Cravel approved more of it while God of Darkness found it very lacking. Elric on the other hand was drooling over his new look and the body he was going to live within his new life. From now on, Elric Johnson no longer exists. From now on, my name is Khan. Elric declared. A new name. A new life. He said with a newfound will to live. Suddenly yellow intrinsic patterns appeared on Elric's body and were ingrained into it. They disappeared without a trace the next second. G.O.D. spoke, this is a link between you and me. Also the way for us knowing that you're still alive. Let's do it. Elric said, ready to embark on his new journey. Unbeknownst to Elric, Another red ancient and divine pattern appeared on his back but didn't emit any light. Both G.O.D. and Cravel noticed it but didn't speak as if nothing happened and it wasn't intentional. God of Darkness didn't waste any more time and simply merged Elric's soul form with the newly created physical body. And after they were merged perfectly, he opened the very crack in the void from where he and Cravel entered inside the world boundary. I'm sending you somewhere remote and safe. Somewhere other gods. Archmages of empires or popes of churches won't be able to detect your arrival. What happens from there will depend on you. And we won't be able to talk after this unless you find a way to recreate churches and temples for me again. And do remember the most important thing. God of Darkness paused his words and continued. Trust nobody and never let your guard down. G.O.D. commanded in his firm and majestic tone as if it was his decree. Elric nodded back in affirmation. He understood the importance of not revealing his secrets and relying on only himself more than the beings in front of him. The crack exerted a form of gravitational pull on Elric, now Khan. Inside the world of Vantry, in a deep jungle unknown, a small void crack appeared five meters above the ground covered with dark green and lush grass. Suddenly a naked body of a man jumped down from the void crack and landed on his right knee and right fist on the ground. Stabilizing himself in just a second. Finally. Chapter 10, Let the Hunt Begin. Who could this be other than Khan? Elric's new body. Now Khan was something he always dreamed of and wanted to have in his ideal standards of a physical body. He was 6 feet 3 inches tall, normal white skin tone same as his previous life. He had an angled but somewhat wider jaw. His face was well proportioned and very handsome. He had bulging muscles and six pack ABS. Unlike his previous life, this time his hair color was completely black and not brown. They were smooth, soft, and wavy. His hair was done from the right side from his perspective. They were long but not till his shoulder length long either. His eyes were black, unlike his former life where they were blue. It was to not stand out or being assumed as someone from a particular region because blue eyes were always the most noticeable part of particular countries or regions. Black hair and eye color was very universal on the other hand. Author, take down notes boys. If you want six pack ABS without working out, all you have to do is commit suicide and get reincarnated. Thanos, 
a small price to pay for salvation. His built was very balanced. His upper body had wider shoulders and big arms, his chest was big enough to align well with his built. His forearms were well proportioned as well while the legs matched that of an athlete. From his appearance, he looked around 25 to 26 years old. Someone who would have a bodybuilding background or someone who trained for gymnastics. His facial structure was something that would be very striking no matter where he went. He chose to base it on the combination of both Bruce Wayne aka Batman and Dick Grayson aka Nightwing, two of the most handsome fictional characters he ever came across in his past life. Not too manly but not too handsome either. That way he could look like someone not to be messed with and not too broody or serious either. So both the younger and older people could approach him. He chose this age and build because of many reasons. Mainly because he didn't like or more likely detested stories where Mick is reincarnated inside a 15 years old kid who somehow can stand toe to toe against adults and people who trained for their entire lives thanks to the almighty plot armor. He was 30 years old in his former life for God's sake. Naturally, he wouldn't want to look like a kid again. And 30 or more would also make him look like a middle-aged person which would stop him from entering some places or mix in a circle of youngsters. So 25 was the ideal age for appearance in his opinion. Khan was brimmed with life and joy. He could finally feel the sensation of having a body again. He could feel the chill in the air and the breeze going past him. He smelled the earthly scent in the air. This was the time of early morning so the sunrise brightened up his surrounding. He took a deep breath and finally felt alive. He didn't know how long it had been since he died on earth. Maybe years or decades, or even thousands of years. But he didn't care about that now. This was going to be the world he would live in from now on. This was his second chance at life. Wait, I don't have a single cloth on my body. Khan exclaimed and suddenly shouted looking towards the sky, you damn cheapskate of a god. You couldn't even give me some clothes? God of darkness my ass. They should call you God of beggars instead. Khan said furiously. God of darkness was very pitiful. But he quickly came to terms with it. It wasn't the most important thing now. Well, based on average story pattern of a reincarnation novel and mangas. I will soon find some lone traveler in the jungle who is being chased by monsters or some princess who is either being attacked by bandits or have people chasing after her. Which one will it be? Khan spoke to himself and started looking around. But in the next moment, he heard a very grim and deathly growl from behind him. And the survival instinct ability kicked in. Giving him goosebumps on his entire body. The growl felt like it belonged to some wild beast. A predator at that. Khan turned his head around and saw what was standing just five meters behind him. Three giant wolves, around seven feet tall. Their eyes were completely red and their pupils looked like they were focusing on their prey. Two of them had a mix of black and white fur while the one standing in the front had completely red fur. It looked like it was the leader of the pack. These three wolves were prying at Khan, trying to gauge how strong their morning breakfast was. To their surprise, Khan was already having beads of sweat falling from his forehead. All he could do is say one word. Fuck. Amidst a vast and dark green forest, a naked man ran without the care of having onlookers like an exhibitionist. It's not like he wanted to but he simply didn't have time to look for clothes or something to cover him. Behind the man, ran three golden retrievers, mm, three wolves. Khan was running for his life as the three giant wolves ran behind with full murderous intent in their eyes and hunger in their stomachs. This was not the welcome Elric, now Khan had imagined. WTF. That's not how a protagonist of a story is introduced in a new world. That damn fucker sent me right in front of a pack of wolves, Khan cursed God of Darkness for having an extremely bad timing to send him into Ventry. But to no avail. All he could do was run off for his life. Khan thought it'd be an easy job to kill monsters like they do in novels and mangas but damn, these monsters weren't easy to defeat at all. The three wolves behind him were seasoned veterans. When he tried to run in any direction, one of them would close his way to exit and another one would close off the other possible route Khan could take. And the leader of this trio was even fiercer. 
the Red Wolf didn't stop trying to go for the kill every time it attacked Khan. Every move was done in a way to finish off its prey in a single sweep. Khan was truly cornered because of their excellent teamwork. Now he understood how lethal just a pack of wolves was. Nothing like how they show in novels, mangas and animes where an inexperienced mech easily kills off an entire pack just using some lame magic skill or a single swing of his sword. These things knew how to hunt. If not for his extremely well-toned body full of muscles and agile build, Khan would be barbecued by these wolves already. The trio kept running after Khan and Khan kept running like Usain Bolt. Only when Khan came near a cliff did he stop. Fuck. No way around it. Wait, did they just intentionally lead me here? Khan asked himself. Because this was indeed a great strategy. Because whether the wolves killed him or he jumped down, Khan was bound to die and wolves were bound to enjoy a delicious meal. Khan glared towards the wolves, mainly at the red wolf who looked like the alpha. Khan knew he had war dominance or to scare off his enemies thanks to the blessings given by Kravel, the war deity. But he didn't know exactly what was his strength level and the wolves hunting him. There wasn't any status window here telling him what his level and stats were and how strong his pursuers were compared to him. What do I do? Should I jump down instead? Khan asked himself and took a look behind the cliff. Strong winds blew past his naked body and he saw how tall the cliff was above the ground level at the bottom. Damn it. I'll definitely die I jump from here, Khan had no other way to get out of his current predicament. There were many things he wasn't sure about. Like what if he even used both War Dominant Sora and Berserk God Mode together and even that's still not enough to beat or even escape from his opponents? These were wolves after all, not humans who would run out of breath after running extremely fast for some minutes. At this moment, the Red Wolf started walking towards Khan with a visible mockery on its face. They had already seen that Khan only looked big for a human but not exactly brave or strong at all. Fuck it. Looks like I have no other choice. Though I don't know if I'll survive against these bastards, it's still better than jumping down, Khan finally decided to give it all to his only chance. Forget about killing the demon god, he looked like he couldn't even kill a damn wolf here. Khan didn't know how to activate his abilities yet but he didn't feel like there wasn't something like a command word there either. Let's give it a try he said to himself and thought about him being superior and stronger than his enemy now. Khan remembered the part in the description of war dominance that it also depended on his emotions. Since he had been running like a coward all this time, he didn't think about using it this way. Khan calmed his mind looked at the approaching red wolf. The other two wolves as usual covered his right and left side to not let him escape. Khan finally cooled down and thought about that one feeling he rarely felt in his past life. Feeling of power and absolute domination. Like bloody hell I'm dying in this unknown place. I finally got my second chance. Nobody is taking it away from me, Khan shouted in his mind and raised his anger towards the approaching wolf. Suddenly, a black horse started exuding out of his body as Khan raised his will to kill the wolf in front of him to survive. It was kill or be killed for real this time. In just the next few seconds, the aura that covered him dimmed a lot but it didn't disappear completely. Rather the tangible pressure around him increased as if gravitational force around Khan became much more dense and heavier. The red wolf faltered its footsteps and felt like something as heavy as a boulder had been placed on its body. Its hind legs started giving out and its back arched down as well. It looked towards Khan again only to find him hard to look at. The Red Wolf felt like Khan was no longer the meek prey but something that was going to hunt them instead. But it tried to defy this pressure and forced itself to walk towards Khan again. It was just five meters away from its prey now. Khan was stunned. Damn it. It's not enough, he yelled in his mind. What about the combat techniques? I can't find a way to activate them either. Where the fuck is my game system dude? Kama Khan cursed in his head. The war dominant or he was excluding wasn't strong enough to completely suppress the enemy in front of him. He also had the knowledge of all combat techniques given by Kravel but he simply didn't know how to use or activate them. Don't tell me that they'll activate when I try to fight with this wolf for real. Like how real warriors fought in battle. 
and there's no command or way to perform these combat techniques? Khan thought. If this was the only way, then he had no other choice but to seek out his enemy in a frontal clash. Berserk God Mode, Khan shouted and dashed towards the Red Wolf which was trying to attack Khan, unlike the other two wolves who couldn't tolerate the pressure of his aura and has slumped down on the ground. Khan ran towards the Red Wolf and quickly covered the distance between them, the Red Wolf bare his sharp claws and swung his left claw towards Khan's chest. At this moment however, Khan felt like something happened to his own body. The moment he thought about going in berserk god mode, he felt like his muscles suddenly gained double the strength, his feet felt like they could move much faster and as the claw of the red wolf was coming towards him, he gained a form of perception and his reflexes were twice faster than before. And slid below the upcoming claw and quickly gave an uppercut towards the red wolf's mouth. Bam! The red wolf got struck in the jaw and lost its balance. It was already fighting against the pressure from Khan's dominant Sora and as he was struck hard in its mouth, it lost the balance. This was just enough to make it fall on the ground. Thump. The wolf fell, Khan on the other hand felt like his fist nearly broke. Even in berserk god mode which would make him five times stronger for a short amount of time, this barely met the mark to just land a solid hit on the red wolf. This means he was very weak against these monsters to begin with. Khan quickly hit the fallen wolf on its head and groped its neck in a chokehold. His muscle and veins were popping out of his body and he felt like he was on a huge adrenaline spike but his brain also told him that this was just temporary. Khan mustered all his strength and used all his force on trying to snap the struggling wolf's neck. The wolf wriggled around with Khan on its body and tried to bite him with its large and long fangs struggling to get out of Khan's arms. Khan shouted and used all his strength to break the wolf's neck. Crack! The wolf whimpered for the last time before its body slumped down on the ground, dead on the spot. Suddenly, a ding notification sound appeared in Khan's head. Khan on the other hand didn't pay any attention to it and quickly ran towards the wolf that was covering his left escape route. He came close to the already slumping wolf and joined both of his hands in a joint fist and quickly slammed it on the wolf's head with all his might. A cracking sound was heard from the wolf's head and blood started leaking out of its ears and mouth. Khan was already on his last arrow. He knew he didn't have any more time. He gathered his remaining strength and ran towards the last remaining wolf which was covering his right exit route. Khan could feel his strength running out already but he kept running and came close to the wolf which was finally somehow started resisting against Khan's dominant Sora. No, you don't. Khan yelled and jumped with all his strength in his legs and performed a downside kick like how they showed in martial arts movies. Bang! The kick landed right between the wolf's skull and broke it in half. Blood splattered on the ground and Khan who didn't time his landing and footing properly also lost his balance and fell down. I did it. Khan shouted as his body slumped on the ground and he lost all the strength in his body. Only now did he realize how much toll did the berserk god mode took on his body. Currently, he didn't even have enough strength to lift his head up or change the side of his body. He was laying down in the grass and soil. He could feel the soil in his face and back as small pebbles were hurting his body. Barely made it, Khan came to realize how big of a close call this was. Any second later and he'd be ripped to shreds by that last wolf which was lying just a meter close to him, its blood still leaking out of its smashed head. Fuck, this hurts. Khan could feel his entire body under immense pain. Mainly both of his fists and his right leg he used to kick the last wolf. Ding. Congratulations to the host for unlocking the following abilities for the first time. War Dominance, Combat Techniques, Berserk God Mode, War Deity Body, the host has learned Choke Hold, Vertical Stomp and Joint Fist Combat Techniques. Current Mastery for these three The Combat Techniques, 30% on Master Rank. War Deity Body will undergo an upgrade after the host is no longer under weakened state. There you are. Dot. Dot 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 hi. This is Novel Admire. Thanks for the visit. Come back again for more novels.